when in my first few weeks, I did charge only 40 bucks an hour, 50 bucks an hour. And then I, 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 I increased it to 75 an hour, like three months in, and I got more clients out of it. And it's like, okay, well, there's clearly something going on here where, you know, if you charge a bit more and you're in that sweet spot, you will just naturally get more clients who can appreciate or want to pay that extra dollars per hour. You're listening to The Successful Bookkeeper with your host, Michael Palmer. Listen each week as inspiring guests share their secrets of success to help you increase your confidence, work smarter, and build a business you love. This episode of The Successful Bookkeeper is brought to you by purebookkeeping.com, the proven system to grow your bookkeeping business. Welcome back to the Successful Bookkeeper Podcast. I'm your host, Michael Palmer, and we have part two of our two-part series with bookkeeping business owner, Andrew Seguin of Seguin Financial. In this conversation, he'll share valuable insights about how to build a thriving bookkeeping firm and how to maintain a strong work culture, plus much, much more. Again, let's get to that chat. We talked about Bit of the startup phase, the little bit of the marketing, getting some clients. Now let's talk about the transition to business. What you you know where you're actually okay? I've, I'm working by myself now. I want to hire some staff. What did that look like for you? Yeah. So after year one, I was doing about seventy seventy five thousand a year in revenue, and I have always had the mindset of hire before you're swamped. So like. Now, to be fair, when I started my business, I was like, I'm going to hire my first employee in three years. I was like, it'll take me three years to hire me. So it took me one year. It took me one year. Wow. And I also had the, you know, the mindset of hire full-time. Mm. Like, I know it took me a whole year of running my business to really learn the in and outs of bookkeeping for small business owners. Because accounting in school is fundamentally different than actual real-life bookkeeping. It it is. It's like, and that's why there are some amazing bookkeeping courses out there that teach you the real fundamentals for small business bookkeeping. But I knew that if I was going to hire somebody, I had to do it before I got full capacity because I didn't want to not have enough time to train this person to develop the skill set. Because bookkeepers six years ago, five years ago, you know, there was not a lot of bookkeepers who understood cloud solutions, right? QuickBooks Online and receipt management tools. And that was very new to them. So having to teach them the new way in doing bookkeeping was time consuming at the early set. Uh, but I knew from, from day one, if I was going to hire somebody, it was going to be full time because it takes a long time to train somebody. And, you know, in my mind, I thought it was to take three months. It takes really in my mind, six months to have them to be comfortable for them to do their work. And if they're part-time, that stretches out that time by two times or longer, right? So that three-month timeline now takes six, or six months takes 12 months, and that's a long time to get somebody comfortable. So I hired somebody in my first year, after, after my first year, I hired them full-time. And I uh, went to college with her, and she's still with me today. Um, she, so she'd be hitting her five-year mark in a few months. Uh, but I knew that was really, really important to me. And... I had no system in place to train somebody. And I, I would say that is one area I can confidently say I am not the greatest at, um, like being a manager. And I, I think it's because, one, I didn't like learn how to be a manager. I never had that sort of skill set. But also, uh, I think it's a positive thing, but I'm very open to my team. Like I do not hide anything from them. I try to be, again, how I am as a person with my clients and my friends, the same way with my team members. Uh, nice. I try to support them as much as I can. Uh, I will always drop what I'm doing to make sure that they're comfortable with whatever tasks they're working on. Uh, but I'm really goofy and outgoing with them. And I really try to build a positive work culture, you know, rapport with them. And I, I had that mindset from day one. Like when I hired my first team member, and you no, know, now we're a team of eight, including myself, same, same mindset, which is, you know, have an awesome work culture um, and f try to find people that you will, I personally know. And that's what I did. I, I hired, you know, I have three more team members that I knew personally when I brought them on. So 
I think personality is very important in a bookkeeping firm. I think you can teach them bookkeeping. Like if they have a competency level that is like, is there, like they want to learn, they, they, but you, personality, I think goes such a long way with how they communicate with clients, how they communicate with your team. They are, they're, understanding and need to learn and to want to get better at their profession. I think personality for me actually ranks higher than like what their resume states or what their work experience states. And that's, I, I think I've gotten lucky and very fortunate to work with an amazing team over the last few years. Mm, I love it. And you know, really you're hiring slowly because you're hiring people, you know, uh, you've met yep. them, you're, you know, got to get the sense. You're like always thinking about, gee, this person could work for my business or this person would never work for my business, but you're, you're going through that and getting to know people. And then when you hire them, you know what you're getting, uh, yep. which is, which is really cool. And, and then you, you've mentioned a few things also, like you're providing a culture, you're hiring full time, I would imagine in a small community, how, how is it about retention? It sounds like, I mean, obviously you've got someone here for five years now, but what, what has you able to retain them into your business as well? So you know these people, you hire them, not for skill, but personality, yep. but, but then they stick around as well. Yeah. So, you know, I really believe in like providing not only a good work environment, right? So like the best, you know, software and hardware they can use, you know, a good office desk, chair, work from home. But I do provide a lot of benefits on like the sort of non-compensation side of things. So, and compensation side of things. So I, I always try to pay above market. So that's one yeah. thing I try to do. Very cool. Um, I'm not, I'm not going to nickel and dime. Like, you know, uh, I give very aggressive raises based on the value they're providing to me and to the firm. I give 4% pension match. Um, I give 250 bucks a month for group benefits. Uh, I'm very unique in where I provide two hours a week for wellness. So wellness could be, you know, working out the gym, yoga, a walk with your pets, um, napping, like whatever is important to you to like recoup from the difficult sort of day or week you're having. So I pay two hours at a time, like two hours a week, I pay them to actually do that. I also reimburse $500 a week for wellness. So, uh, you know, a gym membership, a month, um, you know, a yoga month. classes. 500 a month. A uh, year, sorry, a sorry, year, sorry. Year. $5 a say, year, whoa, a year. Holy yeah. cow, yeah, I know, I'm I know. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah, so $5 a year. Uh, we also work out uh, every week at a CrossFit gym in our local community uh, every Thursday. So we'll have, we'll have a, 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 a lunch. So I, I, I buy a lunch at a local restaurant We'll have some like training sessions, a meeting, whatever. And then we work out as a team. So Thursday afternoons feel a lot more, a bit loose, a bit more comfortable for some people. And that's great. Uh, so we're, you know, we're sweating, we're laughing, we're crying at the gym. It's a really good, cool. and I really recommend if, if you have a bookkeeping or accounting firm and you do have people locally in your area, I would highly recommend doing some type of activity together. I think it's been the best bonding experience for us. It's amazing. We do two retreats a year where like, like I might bring like a, 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 a caterer, like a private chef to come with us. We rent a, a, a cottage to like just two, three days. We kind of just like, you know, not your typical, like we're going to spend eight hours to do like training. It's more like we're going to like get some team bonding during the work week. So it's not like weekends. We got to like find childcare. It's like during the week. Again, I, I, I pay for that. Um, so yeah, you know, three weeks vacation, five days of sick leave per year where it's like, I believe sick days could also mean a mental health days. It's like, you need a day off to like play video games. Great. Like, please do that. Take care of yourself. I don't need a reason why you're taking a sick day just to say, Hey, I'm going to take a, take a mental health day. Great. Like, I don't want a reason why you, you need to do it. Just go for it. So I really do lean. And I think it comes from my nonprofit background, yes. right? Which is like, you know, they don't provide the best compensation, but they often provide amazing benefits. So I wanted to lean into that, you know, do what I know best. And I think my team, you know, they do appreciate that. And at the end of the day, it's, I, I want to provide the best type of compensation and work environment for them. And it's just nice, right? We buy a local restaurant, we take pictures, we're promoting them. People are like, oh my God, what are you having for lunch this week? Like, can I join? It's just like, it, it just builds community and you know, again, very fortunate to work with an amazing team. We'll get back to the interview right after this word from our sponsor. 
Accountants and bookkeepers trust PayWorks to get it right. Why? Well, the math just adds up. Friendly, expert-level service, plus a surprisingly affordable, Canadian-built payroll platform equals reliable results and a strong foundation for success. You can count on PayWorks the way your clients count on you. In fact, more than 98% of clients who choose PayWorks choose to stay. There are plenty more reasons why PayWorks is right for you. Visit payworks.ca today. Thank you for hearing from our sponsor. Now let's get back to the interview. You know, remarkable, remarkable business. And uh, trying to think of the word here, it's it's one of those uh, uh, conscious, almost a conscious business in that you're providing a great place for people to work, uh, a way to provide for their families, a way to be connected with the community, uh, take care of their mental health, you know, all of these things. And, you know, people will think, oh, my, you know, an obvious question would be like, How? you know, it's a lot of cost, right? Now, I will say my my opinion is that the cost of turnover is, is huge and oh, really yeah. – no, often unmeasured, right? Unmeasured cost of, of turnover, which is why they go, oh, it's expensive to make, you know, pay for all these things when the employees are there. Well, it's a lot more expensive if you did the math on cost to customer experience, loss of customers, the training costs of turnover in the business. So on that note, though, cost, you must have done something with your pricing and how you price, because I'd be mm-hmm. curious, and I'm sure that's a question our listeners are having right now, is how do you make all the numbers work with offering such great compensation and benefits for your for your team? Yeah, that's a I, I had this question a lot in Toronto you know, a few weeks ago, which is like, how do you price? And value pricing obviously is something we even from day one, which I didn't really know the term value pricing. I just call it monthly pricing. I never charge by the hour, almost ever. Uh, the only time is very unique circumstances where it's like I might do an hour or two hours of work on a specific project. Um, but every client, it's either a value fixed price once a year or monthly. And I try to aim ballpark for $100, $100 an hour is what my like average rate is I want to like make on this client. Mm-hmm. Um, so like what, what I'm charging out for my staff. And that's... and. And I don't, so we do track our time. So I, I do have my, time, my my team track their time by client. And I try to aim for a 70%, which is low for a lot of firms, but I try to aim for a 70% sort of metric, which is I want to see 70% of your week tracked. And, I, and my typical rule is I expect about 10 hours a week, which is a lot of people told me it's insane to think about that, but I think it's just the reality of, of this, of where we're at today in this, a economy, but like sort of work environment, I expect 10 hours a week to be waste. Mm. It's just like naturally 10 hours in a, in a work week, I, between lunches, conversations with your team members, you know, going to YouTube, going on your phone, um, working out for wellness, like 10 hours a week is like waste. So 70% roughly is what I want to see. And so what I do is I, I quote them. Now, I don't have a magic formula structure a lot of times i've used my gut in my mm-hmm. intuition in regards to what i think this client how many hours a month this client will take but i am not afraid if i'm wrong to go back to the client in two months time and say hey listen you know based on the information you provided me i was wrong and you know i want to keep working together but i'm going to bring your price up to this and hopefully in those two months I provided so much value from our firm that for them, they're like, okay, $200 a month extra, fine, please. Like, that's it. Like, I'm happy to pay for that because uh, we cannot leave you. Like, please don't leave us. So they're like, whatever, $200 a month, no problem. So I am not afraid to admit when I make mistakes on my pricing to my clients. And sometimes, you know, maybe 10%, that doesn't work out where it's like, like, uh, unfortunately, da, da, da. And we work it out, obviously. But if I make a mistake on my pricing, which doesn't happen as much as it used to, I admit fault and I say, listen, you know, based on our conversation, there was miscommunication or wires tangled. Uh, unfortunately, I have to increase your pricing to this point. But again, hopefully we provided so much value to them that they don't even see themselves going anywhere else. 
Wow. Um, so I do price hundred dollars an hour is like what I try to, and I add some like mental variables like okay, this is a very complex client, you know, or a PETA type of client mm -hmm. um, where I have to like sort of add premiums mm -hmm. um, to the pricing, um, and and at that point, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. But what excites me, you know, what excites me to work with this client through our firm? But hundred dollars an hour is like what I try to strive for. Even from day one, I was like 75 bucks an hour. Like for me to like work with a client, because if I started so low, if I started so low, like 40 bucks an hour, it really becomes tough to bring them up to that level right. where you want to be two years from now, right? How did you get the 75 out of the gate? It's rare. People often start at the bottom, right? They're like, yeah. I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to charge less than what I make, even at the job that I have. And it's it's an innocent mistake that people make because it starts as a side hustle maybe and they're they're just happy to get a little extra cash for doing something that they're good at and that they like doing. But then yeah, it's mm -hmm. an uphill battle when you load up your clients with you know undercharging your your existing clients to bring them up where they need to be. How'd you get it kind of like for six years ago at 75 an hour? That was really high. How did you get there? Yeah, I agree. Yeah. And and um I think for me is I realized in our community and in general, bookkeeping was such high demand, a good bookkeeper. And I trusted myself and I spent a lot of time, a lot of time on Facebook groups, like both successful bookkeeper, you know, the Canadian and the US Facebook groups, all these different Facebook groups, which I highly recommend. Like that has been probably 70% of my learning as a bookkeeper, as a business owner, was through Facebook groups. And I, anyone who's listening, I highly recommend to check them out. It's been an amazing resource and getting to talk to and collaborate with colleagues, just amazing. Like some of my closest colleagues and friends in this industry is because of those Facebook groups. So please check those out. Um, but I knew that, you know, I am providing a high demand service and I knew I was providing a service that is in my community was unique, this mm -hmm. cloud solution. Yep. So if I didn't charge appropriately from day one, there was a mindset when you go to a mechanic or a bookkeeper and you're getting charged 40 bucks, 30 bucks an hour. And there was a mindset, there's a huge mindset where you, somebody charges you 30 bucks an hour versus somebody who's charged you 85 or 75 bucks an hour. There's this mindset where they think, oh, well, why are you charging so little? Mm -hmm. As opposed to 75 bucks an hour, they think, oh, okay, like this person is going to provide good value, not, not potentially better value, but just they sort of have this confidence about them that they feel that they should charge 75 bucks an hour. And it's been weird because when in my first few weeks, I did charge only 40 bucks an hour, 50 bucks an hour. And then I, 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 I increased it to 75 an hour, like three months in, and I got more clients out of it. And it's like, okay, well, there's, Clearly something going on here where, you know, if you charge a bit more and you're in that sweet spot, you will just naturally get more clients who can appreciate or want to pay that extra dollars per hour. It's an interesting, like, I don't know what, so it, it's it was, very I, interesting. I, I read about it, but. Yeah, yeah. the psychology around it uh, is, is fascinating. And you think of your own practices myself, right? It's like, if you want something done correctly, there's going to be a certain mindset of choosing the choice will be on and one of them will be like if i'm buying the cheapest one is this going to work is this going yeah. to fail is it going to be an extra cost that i have to rebuy it redo it do it over again or whatever the case may be now it doesn't always work out for myself personally when i'm like choosing the premium provider i've been burnt right. that way too right of so course. It's, you got to do for making the decision but note that if you've got the service and you've got the pricing at a premium, you're going to attract the people who want a premium service yep. and also likely don't want to be switching. It's like they want to solve the problem, get it solved. And if it's being solved appropriately, they're not going to want to change because it's not yeah, that's not what they're change. interested in. People in premium, they want to buy a great car that is going to, you know, you know, give them all the things last that they want, time. last a long time. And again, they'll rebuy it too, because if it did a great job, why, why do I need a different one? Right. Whereas people yep. who are buying and on price, they're going to be like, Oh, could I get a cheaper? Could I, you know, what about this one? I right. can, you know, you, you're going to get, that's what you're going to get. Yeah. And I feel bookkeeping, you know, if you're doing your job well enough and providing enough value, it's not 
It, they're not going to go and look for the cheaper option. Like you said, I don't want my, t my team members to leave because of that cost, right? That cost to retrain somebody, I will always, and I tell them straight up, I will always tell my team, I will always try to pay you as much as I can so that I don't even want you to think about even leaving. Like mm -hmm. you can always th think and look elsewhere, but it's my responsibility as an owner to keep you here as long as I can. And that's my responsibility. And I make sure I try to pay them as much as I can and provide enough benefits so that even, you know, the another bookkeeping or accounting firm can't match what we provide, right? So same thing with clients, it's like you wanna provide enough value so that even if your pricing is higher, 50% higher than another bookkeeper or, or, or firm, you're providing enough value that they don't even want to think about and they actually get scared of switching providers. Like they, mm. they will, they will get concerned and anxious and stressed out about thinking of having to switch. We do charge a starting fee too. So like an onboarding fee. Mm. I think a lot of bookkeepers don't do that. And I think it's something that should be- Tell us a little bit lean. about that. How does that work? Yeah, so it's a long, it takes, a, it takes time to really onboard, whether my firm, to know the client's processes and to establish processes, because sometimes they don't have processes. They're so used to like dropping paper off at an office and and having the bookkeeper get the work done. You know, with all these new apps and cloud solutions out there, and you know, when it comes to payroll, when it comes to invoicing, when it comes to receipts, accounts payable, there's all these tools that we're having to set up, integrate, train, onboard. Um, sometimes we're migrating accounting systems. I always charge bare minimum 1.5 times a monthly fee. So if we're charging a client $700 a month, I'm looking at bare minimum $1,000 setup fee, just, just for you even to be a client. And what's good about that is you're starting it off on the right foot, mm -hmm. right? If you're saying, I'm gonna charge you from day one just for you to become a client, you know, if they're willing to pay for that and pay the monthly fee, in my opinion, I think we, we, we start them off on the right foot, which is we're not cheap. We're going to charge you some premiums, but again, you got to sort of back up the work with the value side of things. That's right. Deliver but on it. We start off, yeah, we got to deliver, you know, we need the deliverables, but we st when you charge up front a setting a startup fee you at least cover your time and a bit more because it does take a long time to establish processes and procedures and to train to get the client onboarded because it doesn't happen in 30 minutes there's a lot of work to you have to learn what's been happening historically talk to the client new processes so we try we try to charge at least one and a half times if not greater like depending on the client i just quoted a client for Two thousand dollars a month, but it's a it's a four thousand dollar plus starting fee. It's like I love that. And if they're not willing to pay for that, then it's a client I probably don't want to work with because they're not appreciating the time it takes to start a client in our firm. That's right. Uh, I love it, and there's lots of benefit to that because you're mm -hmm. you're you're actually able to invest in setting up the client successfully. And a lot of bookkeepers correct. out there, you're absolutely correct. Rare do I hear this happen, but you're, you're subsidizing the long-term production on yourself by, oh, I got to set up a system. Yeah, because absolutely there's systems and processes internally that you have to set up, data you have to, to, to figure out, as you said, apps and all sorts of things. You got to do all of that. If you're doing it on the front end and you're including it in that you know, oh, well, I'll recoup this over time. No, and now you're on the hook for all of that. Whereas you're yep. saying, you yep. want to be a client, I'm going to, you're going to charge you upfront for all this work and then it's going to be this ongoing rate. I, I think that's a fantastic way to go at it. And, and, and some and, firms, some firms try to say after six months, we'll refund you. I don't do that. Don't do I don't that. say like, yes. don't do that. It's like you've, yes. you've taken a long time to establish your processes and to absorb that knowledge of that client. That is worth something. And if you just discount it, then they can have a higher chance of potentially leaving you because they've gotten this money back. And it's like, it, it's like they have to appreciate the value and the time and understanding you've taken to know that client and, and their processes. And, and I can hear it from you. You own your value. And that's, that mm -hmm. sells as well. When you own the value and you're willing to say no to people, 
that's powerful because people they're they're gonna they're they're watching they're looking at the body language the tonality and they're looking is this person gonna do what they say they're going to do and that's it yeah. i'm willing to pay but if you have it you own it and you own your own confidence it going to translate through your body language going to translate through right from the your get-go. tonality yeah. right from the get go and that's what has people buy they just want they want to buy people who want to buy premium the, the, where they're going to second guess is like, will the premium actually get delivered? And I can sense from you, I can sense already the way you position it, talk about it, it's scripted in a way that you know it well, right? Obviously, you're not yeah. reading from a sheet, but just talking to us today, that's the kind of thing that that sells, right? You ask them lots of questions, you explain the, how the process is going to work, and they're free to choose. Yep. But you're right. Clients don't want to leave bookkeepers. They, 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 they would love to stay with one bookkeeper for as long as they can. And you have an opportunity to wow them, to swag, you know, provide some swagger in regards to what you can do to them and, you know, do, do for them. And I think clients don't want to leave bookkeepers. They don't want to trade bookkeepers and, and, and go from one-on-one. Like, and if, if you're noticing, I would say, like, if they've already swapped multiple bookkeepers and if they often are disparaging a bookkeeper in your first conversation, that is often a conversation you, it's a client you probably don't want to work with. Like, mm-hmm. I think, you know, if they're, now, if there's a saying like, oh, I want to go use new systems and, and they don't want to, that's a different, different thing story. as opposed to, yeah. oh, they were, they were a jerk. They were no good. Oh, I'm, I, my bookkeeper never texts me back. Yes. Yeah. That's yeah. not a client you want to work with no matter what. And I would say, I always see on Facebook posts, awful clients, you know, abusing, in my opinion, abusing us bookkeepers, and you do not ever need to work with those clients. Let those clients go, and then you'll be so free, less stress, and then you can focus on other parts of your business that is needed. So do never let a client abuse or 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 be harsh or mean to you. And I do that with my team. I, t- I tell my team, listen, if a client is ever being mean to you, I will fire them. I will never let, because one client could be so toxic that it will totally. completely destroy your firm inside out. So do not let those clients determine how you run your own practice. Always try to get on top of that if you can. Absolutely love it. I, I absolutely love it. Golden stuff. Now, uh, tell me, uh, you know, I've heard the revenue that you've done through the grapevine. You mentioned it at the conference, but if you want, you can let us know the, the size of your business. We haven't talked about that. Tell us a little bit about the size of your company and where you're headed. Yeah, so, you know, I'm very fortunate and grateful to be running a firm. Now we're 1.3 million a year in revenue is what we're expecting to hit by the end of the year. Um, You know, when I started the firm six years ago, I was like, I just want to match my salary. I was making like $55,000 a year. I was like, I just want to match that. I just like, I want to work four days a week and I want to match that salary. Like, that's my goal. And, you know, it goals they sort of change and they sort of, you know, move around and, and get fluid over time. And, uh, you know, I do work hard. I, I used to work around 55, 60 hours a week in my, like in those COVID areas, eras mm-hmm. where like it, everything was so, so scary, essentially. Uh, I'm comfortable around 45 hours a week now, which is great. I'm hoping to get around 40, 35, 40. Uh, so 1.3 million, uh, we're about 43, 44% owner profit on that number. And I, like, I, I opened the curtain in Toronto. Like I am not afraid to talk about the numbers on my firm because I do want other bookkeepers to realize this is possible. Like I had absolutely zero business owner experience. I was only doing bookkeeping for a nonprofit. Uh, and yes, I put a lot of time and equity and, and, and you know, energy into growing my firm, but this is possible. Like this story is, you can duplicate it. And I didn't have this like, I wasn't paying a $5,000 a month coach to like get where I'm at. Like I just learned everything I could from my peers, from my colleagues, again, Facebook groups, YouTube. I just try to absorb as much as I can. And I do love this industry. I think that goes a long way, right? If you're passionate, your clients will see that. If you are passionate about what you're trying to provide to your clients, clients will get passionate with you. They will get, they will take in that energy, right? So, and I think that, was easy for me to get clients because I was very energetic and passionate about what we can provide to our clients. And 
clients want that. They want to be wow. They want to use the best of the best. And they're willing to pay for that. I do believe that they're willing to pay for good bookkeeping services more than ever, right? And bookkeepers that can help provide a different type of value, not just doing data entry, but can you help answer questions that they might have throughout the year about a wide range of topics? Like, does it make sense if I should hire somebody new? Or, you know, do you recommend to make any changes in my business to cut costs? It's like, it it is a balance act between being a bookkeeper and being this like superhero. I get it. And, and, but if you can lean into that, like sort of mindset, that balancing act of doing more than just your traditional bookkeeping, uh, clients will pay for that. Mm. So we're 1.3 million a year, a team of eight, about 70% of our revenue is monthly recurring. So, you know, just, you know, first of the month, Money comes out of our bank account, pre-authorized debit agreement. I'm not chasing accounts receivable. Again, a client wants to work with us. That's what's happening. Like we will not invoice you on a monthly basis and wait to get paid. Like you will go monthly. Like it's simple as that. And then we have other, you know, ten percent of our revenue is tax revenue. Not a lot, but you know, we we, we have a little bit there. Uh, and then the other twenty percent is a combination of like catch up jobs, training, consulting webinars I get paid for, sort of miscellaneous revenue is like, a lot of it's catch up jobs, like client comes in with like four years of like books and they're like, help me, Obi-Wan Kenobi, you're my only hope. And it just like, <laughs> <laughs> and they sort of give you everything and you sort of have to work your magic. Yeah. Um, we, we do a lot of that, but I'm not afraid to spend money in my firm. So like, you know, when it comes to staffing and like yeah. I said, retention, I'm not afraid to put money in that situation because Somebody leaves and I got to retrain somebody for three, six months. It doesn't matter. I, I should have paid that person an extra three or $4,000 a year, for instance. Because um, I think it, the cost, the cost to retrain somebody. Now I have built like a training package. So it's like, I lean into videos. I do a lot of videos for my clients and my, and my team members. And I built like a depository of training videos. I'm more of like a show and not tell. Mm -hmm. sort of mentality, like, like I, I like to kind of show our team members how to do things as opposed to like writing an email with screenshots. Uh, so I have like a, a depository of videos in different topics. So like payroll topics and taxes and bookkeeping and QuickBooks and pay, like just how to onboard a client and all these things that you will often repeat. My typical rule is if you're going to say it more than once, put it in the video. That way so true. you can give that video to somebody, whether it's a client or a team member, and they can watch it, they can slow it down, they can rewind it, they can speed it up, and less chances of errors. So I initially had like a 100-page training manual. Don't do that. It did not go well. Uh, then I was like, okay, there's got to be a better way. And I had the idea of creating videos. And I had a lot of positive feedback in my session a few weeks ago in Toronto, but like, oh, videos, that's something I should do. And, and I had a lot of people would be like, you should sell them. You should make videos and sell them. I was like, well, it's not like, that's not what I do, but I understand the need. Like, mm -hmm. like videos are powerful, right? And clients, clients appreciate videos. I've gotten so much positive feedback instead of having an email back and forth, back and forth in a phone call and you're wasting 20 minutes, just make a five minute video showing them exactly, you know, what you're looking at and how to do something. Now they have that video to Super reference. Super powerful. And, and, uh, my loom, I use loom and it always sort of teases me of how many meetings I've saved. Something like eight meetings, like a day or something like absurd, like how many, like, like it's, it's a really good resource. And I know some people don't like, you know, hearing their own voice or seeing themselves on the, on the video and I get it, but get comfortable with that. Uh, your clients will really appreciate it. It's fantastic. You know, Loom has transformed our business. I mean, myself personally use it for everything. And I just don't know how, it's like the fax machine. How did we live without the fax machine? I know. And now know. we use them as boat anchors, but yeah. who knows what Loom will become in the future. But yeah, it, you're right. Absolutely, absolutely remarkable. And what what is there for you now for the future? What what Where do you want to take your business? Yeah, so you know, I have these interesting opportunities in front of me and it's something I'm like internally like thinking about uh, 
on a weekly basis. Because I have this opportunity to like, I know I could build a firm in Canada that is 40, 50 employees. Like, I think there is a demand for it, obviously, in, in, in the world, just good bookkeeping services. But it is scary. It, it is like, like being a business owner sometimes can feel like you're on an island. And mm. to do this, I would need the proper people by my side to take it to the next level. And it's, it's exciting. It's exciting. It's scary. I never wanted to grow a very large bookkeeping firm, but I'm thinking about the opportunities. And, but regardless what happens, uh, I'm very happy with where we are. Like if I decide in a few months, I'm just going to stay around this eight to 10 employee, I'm going to be very comfortable, very happy and have an amazing time over the next 20 years. But there is an opportunity to be a 40, 50 plus employee organization. Um, but I'm always afraid of losing who we are as a firm in that mm -hmm. process. And that mm -hmm. always scares me. And I'm not looking to spend that much time growing the firm. It's a different mental energy, I find. Like, I love bookkeeping. I love talking to clients. But when you're having to manage more people and have them, you know, a sort of mindset of I'm growing my firm, it's tough. I, com I commend anybody who's grown their firm over that to eight to 10 employee size, because I can understand how lucrative it could be, but how difficult it also is in that journey. So yeah, right now, I think my goal is, I think I, I'm going to plan to make a set of videos, like a, 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 a public set of videos uh, to the community, I think, on just different topics, whether it's like things we're talking about today and what worked for me and how to do very specific tasks for payroll and QuickBooks and stuff like that. I think, I think there's a huge need for that. And I want to provide back to the community that was so kind to give me um, some of cool. that guidance. Very cool. And then just keep working with my team and my clients. You know, we're very selective with clients now. We've gotten to this comfortable position where I will price clients very much appropriately uh, because we're very selective. Uh, so, so, you know, clients four years ago, I would quote them all the time because I really wanted to get clients. Now it's like, okay, it's not even a good fit for me anymore. Uh, what else can, can we do some training for them? Maybe we can train them to do their own bookkeeping and we can like support them. Um, but those, those clients I used to quote monthly, I don't quote anymore. So it's just, I think just getting comfortable with the position we're in is, is a possibility here at this point. Very cool. Very cool. This has been great, Andrew. For those of our listeners that want to learn more about you, where can they do that? Yeah, check out my website, uh, www.segingfinancial.ca. Uh, you can email me, andrew at segingfinancial.ca. You can also check me on LinkedIn. I don't do a lot of LinkedIn posts, but I started to ramp up a little bit in the last few months. Um, but yeah, you can check me out in those areas. And, and if anybody, any listener here, uh, wants to get my opinion on anything, I'm happy to jump on a call with you uh, and do whatever I can. It's so beautiful. please reach out. I absolutely love it. Andrew, you've built a remarkable firm. You've done, I mean, like I was talking about the seven secrets of growing your bookkeeping business, which we still run to this day. And you could be the instructor of that course. I mean, just each, you're doing <laughs> all honor. seven. You're doing all seven. And, and Thanks, it's, Michael. It's, fa it's, fa it's fantastic to see and hear. And of course, you bring your, your own unique strengths to it. I can see those strengths. And, and everyone comes with different strengths and comes with different weaknesses. You're so transparent about your journey and where, where you've been and where you are now today. It's been a real, real pleasure having you on the show. And, well, it's been and an honor to, to have, be here. It's amazing. Thank you. What a terrific and inspiring conversation with Andrew. A big thank you to him for being on the show. And I hope you, the listener, took away some great tips that could be helpful to you in some way. And with that, we wrap another episode of the Successful Bookkeeper Podcast. To learn more about today's wonderful guest and to get access to all sorts of valuable free business building resources, you can go to thesuccessfulbookkeeper.com. Until next time, goodbye. You've been listening to The Successful Bookkeeper with Michael Palmer. 
For more information and to download the resources mentioned in this episode, please visit us at thesuccessfulbookkeeper.com. Thank you for listening.